people use these terms differently. The way I use these words is sort of grounded in our biology and in trying to simplify things. So by mind, I use that term as the information represented by a nervous system. In that sense, a cat has a mind because a cat has a nervous system whose function is to represent information. A worm has a very simple mind because their nervous system is really, really simple. Now that doesn't necessarily mean just because there's mind and mental processing and information processing of different kinds that there's the capacity to think about your own mind that human beings have. But still, there is mind. And it's a simple, clear definition. The function of the nervous system in all animals is to process information, to receive it, to communicate it, to store it, to transform it, to operate upon it, and to learn from it. So that's a very straightforward definition of mind. It's entirely within the natural frame, this definition. Uh, information is intangible, but it is a natural phenomenon. You do not need a supernatural explanation for the information that is conveyed by a red light compared to a green light, or the information that's conveyed um, in the squiggles, the marks in a clay tablet by the Babylonians or on a billboard today. And in ways that are not entirely clear yet, the natural flows of information that are supported by the natural activity of a nervous system give rise to experiences, certainly in human beings, certainly evident in simple, even simple animals like a fish, uh, maybe a crab, maybe a shrimp. Um, shrimp have the uh, neurotransmitters that also are used to support experiences of anxiety in human beings. Maybe teeny tiny worms or little zombies with just 302 neurons, but most of our animal cousins are having experiences. Who would deny that a dog is having experiences? Right? Or an eagle, or a dolphin, or an elephant, right? So, so far we're still inside the natural frame. Now some might extend that to talk about cosmic mind, infinite mind, okay, maybe, but clearly inside the natural frame, there is mind. Now what is awareness? Awareness, think of a squirrel, is a squirrel aware of um, the nut, the acorn? Is a squirrel aware of the chittering of another nearby squirrel who also wants that acorn, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, do most animals sleep? And they lose, conscious, they're, they lose awareness. They are no longer aware. So again, awareness is a natural phenomenon. Maybe there's infinite awareness. I'm growing in my belief about that. But minimally, inside cats, squirrels, fish, lizards, a spider is very aware of stimuli and responsive to it. Humans are aware of various things. There is awareness of. So um, that's one way to understand it. Another way is to think of awareness as a kind of field in which experiences are occurring. These are all very natural ways of thinking about it. Now, if you want to go beyond that, some do, you could think about awareness that is embedded in the underlying nature of everything, the ground of everything, and um, is transpersonal, cosmic, infinite, divine, if we dare use that word, may be combined as well with benevolence. And that's a whole territory for people to consider. That said, Whoop! Inside the scientific frame, the natural frame, clearly, there are mental processes grounded in information processing, and there are experiences, and there are degrees of awareness, and we can think of awareness as a kind of field in which experiences are constructed, arise, and pass away. And for me, that's a simple way to think about it intellectually, which then, of course, goes to practice. And we are very aware of it. As mental activity gets quieter, there's less and less flotsam and jetsam in the streaming of consciousness. It starts to become simpler. There are sensations. There are sounds. In deep meditative absorption states, 
even those drop out. Sensations start dropping out, sounds start dropping out. More and more, there's just awareness. With, in the background, a sense of awareness of awareness, maybe, that's still a little dualistic, and even that starts to gradually fade. So there's just presence, presence. And as we increasingly shift our identity, our identity, so that we identify more and more with not any particular content, any particular experience or thought or belief or emotion or body sensation or sense of self even, as we identify less and less with the contents of awareness, we start identifying increasingly with the field of awareness in its, with its spaciousness and openness and um, stillness in the sense that it, contents of awareness change, but awareness doesn't change. Then those qualities of spaciousness, presence, and stillness become increasingly our home. We rest in them increasingly. They, they gradually fill us and, you know, shade our inner landscape, which is one of the values in doing practices that help you rest increasingly as awareness. As soon as you start thinking about being awareness, then there's one more piece of content floating through awareness. Oh. You gradually even disengage from thoughts about awareness to just abiding as awareness. <laughs>